Hi everybody. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Bob McMaster tonight. We have been talking about having him, inviting him to come for two years perhaps. <coughs> and with COVID, it's always been mm, soon, mm, a little bit in a while. So I'm delighted that it's finally happening and we finally have you here. Um, Bob has published a wonderful biography of Edward Hitchcock. And I was really surprised to learn that nobody has written a biography of him before. You know, as a geologist, famous paleontologist, president of Amherst College, he had an international reputation. Um, and nobody has written his life story before. And Bob was not one to do a quick job on this, or a, a skimming job. He began work in 2017 transcribing Edward Hitchcock's unpublished sermons, which gave him great insights into what moved the man and what his own inspirations were. Um, and what's also interesting, which Yulia told me tonight, is that Bob's trajectory was not unlike Edward Hitchcock. Edward Hitchcock started out as a pastor in Conway uh, between 1824 and 27, 26, 27? 1821 and 1825. Okay, there you go. And then from there he became a professor of chemistry at Amherst College. <coughs> he is one of the pioneers of geology, one of the founding fathers of paleontology, and also became president of Amherst. He was helped in large part by having a very talented wife who was an artist and who illustrated his lectures and who, um, who helped him and, and illustrated his, both his lectures and his published works. So uh, I just want to mention that Bob grew up in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Southbridge. Southbridge, sorry. He attended graduate school at Andover and Newton Theological School and Boston College, earning a master's degree in geology and education at BC. He also earned a master's in biological sciences at Smith. And he went on and he got his PhD in plant biology at the University of Massachusetts. Starting out in the theological realm and moving into the science realm, we were following in the footsteps of Edward Hitchcock. Thank you, sir. <laughs> different centuries, different times. Um, I want to mention afterwards, if you are interested, we have copies of Bob's book here. And we also have another book that he's written, The Darkest Before Dawn. He's always had an interest in uh, mysteries and this is one of the series. It's, a, it's part of a series. It's a mystery romance set in the Connecticut Valley in the 19-teens. Also an interesting book, I'm sure. So Bob will sign them, and they're available for sale. And with that, welcome, Bob. And thank, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary and Julia and Peter and everybody from the Society. Uh, and all of you folks for coming out tonight, even when there was a red alert. <laughs> we got a, a phone call just as I was about to leave the house saying a severe storm alert. Thankfully, that didn't develop too much. Um, anyway, uh, I was here four years ago on the night when, um, um, on the night when Sarah um, Doyle spoke about the Hitchcocks um, and did an excellent, excellent job. I'll try not to repeat too much of what she said uh, because I think that I'll uh, go off in directions a little bit different from what she went into um, than a sort of hard met rather than replicate uh, what Sarah had to say to you on that night. Um, so, Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, has had more than its share of um, historic figures that have become icons. Uh, this lady needs no introduction, of course. Um, from Amherst, there is uh, Mary Lyon, that pioneer in women's higher education from South Hadley. Um, Jonathan Edwards, 
who warned, of Northampton, who warned his parishioners uh, to tend to their souls lest they fall into the hands of an angry God. Um, and then there was this man, Edward Hitchcock, uh, poet, playwright, philosopher, paleontologist, professor, preacher, and president of Amherst College. <laughs> Lots of peas there. Um, easily one of the most influential scientists in America and in Europe in his day. Um, and now Emily Dickinson has had many biographies written of her, some rather fanciful, I might point out. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Edwards has had a few, and Mary Lyons a few. But I was surprised, as Mary mentioned, to, to learn some years ago that there'd never been a biography written for Edward Hitchcock. And so in 2017, I began uh, my research. And in fact, it was the very year that I was uh, here at that meeting. And um, uh, there, uh, Four years later, my book is finally in print. It's called All the Light Here Comes From Above, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitchcock. So just to go through some of the basics, most of you probably all know this, but Edward was born in Deerfield in 1793 in that very house, and I bet most of you could uh, recognize that house. Uh, he and his siblings, there were four older siblings, all attended this school, Deerfield Academy, which was almost within sight of their house. In fact, Edward's eldest brother, Henry, you can see his name is Harry there, uh, attended, was in attendance of the very first class that entered Deerfield Academy on a cold January day in 1799, and I'll bet the heat in that building wasn't so no good. Um, Edward, sp Edward spent four year, uh, six years there, parts of six years there, 1804 to 1809. Um, we don't know exactly how much of each of those years he spent. Uh, but the records over at the Pocomtuck Valley Memorial Association show you that his parents paid the, um, the uh, tuition each uh, term. Um, but that six years, those six years that he spent at Deerfield Academy would be the entirety of his formal education. That was it. He left there in 1809 and was never formally in enrolled in another school thereafter. And I'm pretty amazing when you consider what he accomplished in his life. Well, just seven years after leaving Deerfield as a student, he returned as headmaster. That's a pretty uh, meteoric rise, isn't it? Of course, he was well known in Deerfield at the time, and he'd already made a reputation for himself uh, nationally, scientifically. So it's perhaps not all that surprising. Um, he was the preceptor, the teacher of the male students. Now, Deerfield Academy was a very progressive institution. It believed in the equal education of young men and young women, but not in the same room at the same time, God forbid, right? So they had the preceptor for the male students, and they had the preceptress for the female students, and that was Aura, Miss Aura White. And full disclosure, that's not really a picture of Aura. We don't have a picture. I think Sarah used that back in her presentation, too. We don't have any images of Aura from, as a young girl. But that's a, a drawing she did of a young woman at about that time. So that will just have to suffice for us. She had already been an employee of the academy, as you can see, for several years when Edward arrived. And they became colleagues. They became friends. And the course eventually became much more. Aura was uh, from Amherst. She was uh, very um, talented in the decorative arts, is the expression that they used in those times. Uh, but she also had a good deal of ability in math and science as well. Aura was a devout Calvinist. The term Orthodox Christian was used at that time. One who believes in the uh, fun fundamentals, uh, what we would call uh, Christian fundamentalism today, um, emphasizing the personal relationship between a believer and God, repentance for one's sins, and renewal of one's heart in order to achieve salvation. And she succeeded in converting Edward, because Edward grew up in Deerfield, and Deerfield was Unitarian, the polar opposite <laughs> of, and, and arch, arch enemies of uh, fundamental Christianity, some, some would say. So she succeeded in converting Edward to um, her fundamentalist faith, and that faith would be central to them for the rest of their lives uh, together. 
Now, Edward's tenure at Deerfield was brief, as you can see, only about two years. He was dismissed in the, sometime around September of 1818, not because of any shortcomings on his part, but because the academy was having difficulties, financial difficulties. And in fact, just a few months after he was dismissed, the academy shut its doors temporarily. Um, and so um, they, uh, Edward was now without a job. <laughs> well, the following spring, he traveled to New Haven and attended classes at Yale for about seven weeks, not as a registered student, um, but as what we might call an auditor today. And he uh, sat in on the classes of these two eminent scholars and uh, professors. Benjamin Silliman was a geologist and chemist, and Ele Eliezer Fitch was a theologian. Now, Yale was uh, strongly and decidedly fundamentalist or Calvinist at that time. So you can imagine that Edward felt quite at home with his new faith there, much more probably than he did back in Deerfield with all the Unitarians to you know, turn you from the path of righteousness or whatever. Uh, so Edward felt very much at home there. Eliezer, oh, oh, and of course, why was Yale uh, a, a Calvinist institution, an Orthodox Christian institution? The president of Yale at the time was Timothy Dwight, and Timothy Dwight was the grandson of, anybody know? Jonathan Edwards. Uh, so how could yeah. Yale be anything else yeah. than a fundamentalist institution? Harvard, on the other hand, was Unitarian. So Yale and Harvard were fighting for the souls of New Englanders, and it was a pitched battle, I can tell you. Um, and um, so there's quite a bit in my book about uh, that uh, religious uh, tension between Yale and, um, and Harvard. Um, after seven weeks, probably through the uh, influence of Professor Hitch, Edward was invited to preach a sermon at the West Haven Congregational Church. And it was the first sermon he ever preached. And afterwards, he wrote this note to himself, which I think is amusing. Felt much solicitude, diffidence, and weakness in this first effort in the pulpit but have much reason to be grateful that utterance was given me. I feel fearful that my lungs never will pre permit me to preach long should I live to complete my studies, but with God, all things are possible. I find that amusing because this was the first of over a thousand sermons that Edward Hitchcock pre <laughs> preached in his career. <laughs> and a lack of utterance was never a problem <laughs> for Edward Hitchcock. <laughs> Not a lack of verbal utterance, and he was a prolific writer, too, as we'll, as we'll see. When Edward came back to Deerfield, he had a new voice and a new vocation. He was now Edward Hitchcock, itinerant preacher. And there we see him in his horse and buggy, galloping up and down the Connecticut Valley, uh, preaching, filling in for pulpit supply, is what the term he used, and that's still used today, uh, to mean filling in for a preacher on a Sunday when the preacher is, you know, on a professional development day or something like that. And uh, he was obviously very well liked because in two years he delivered 108 sermons, 37 different sermons, but 108 times. And the numbers show you how many times he preached in each town. So for instance, he preached six times in Springfield, nine times in Deerfield, no surprise there, 13 times, 15 times in Brattleboro, and 30 times in the little town in the foothills of the Berkshires called Conway. Uh, I say a little town, but as you probably know, it wasn't that little a town. In fact, about that time, it was the third largest town in population in western Massachusetts. It would be hard to believe, but that's what I read. Um, and so, why did he get invited back again and again and again in just two years, 30 times? I don't know if that's 30 Sundays or 30 sermons, because every Sunday, a minister had to preach two sermons. Either way, he was very busy in Conway, and the reason was simple. John Emerson, nice exhibit for him right here, John Emerson was approaching his 70th birthday. He'd been doing that job for half a century, and he was in failing health. And so he called upon, or the church called upon Edward again and again to fill in, and established a relationship there. Um, and Edward uh, would remain in uh, uh, Hitchcock. At times, he even gave his... Uh, 
Edward remained in Conway, at times even gave Conway as his mailing address during that time period. Exactly how the um, call to Conway came about is recorded in these extraordinary microfilms of the town uh, clerk's uh, records. And if any of you have not seen these, they're, they're really amazing. They really reveal so much about town government and about the history of this town. And I've provided a link right on my webpage that will take you right to the pages that I'm going to show you and lots more too. There's like 60 or 70 years in the 19th century that are all available online. And I'm just going to show you three or four. Um, here it is June 1820 and it says uh, that a motion was voted upon to see if the Congregational Society in said town will raise a sum of money for the purpose of procuring a clergyman to assist Mr. Emerson in his ministerial office. That was in June of 1820. Seven months later, you can see they're still wrestling with this. Um, <laughs> town government moved slowly in those days, right? Um, and here they are once again hiring Edward as they had many times before to preach um, uh, Sundays, six or seven, six, five or six Sundays in a row. But then in, June, in April, either April or May, the date is a little uncertain, they finally got down to business and voted to unite with the church in giving Mr. Edward Hitchcock a call. That's the townspeople at the town meeting uniting with the con congregation of the church that were two different entities, although they were closely linked, as you know, um, in giving Edward Hitchcock the call. And the very next day, no, the, the, that same um, meeting, uh, they give you the details that they voted to give Mr. Hitchcock $500 annual salary plus $1,000 settlement. Um, and um, the salary was paid through a minister's tax. Did you know that Massachusetts was the last town, the last uh, state in the nation to do away with uh, tax support of the Congregational Minister in the town, and that didn't happen for another 12 years or so. <clears throat> so folks pay, everybody in town paid for the minister's salary through that tax. But then there was the $1,000 settlement, and I think that that settlement, I know that settlement was made through contributions, voluntary contributions by church members. And there's a list a couple of pages later of all of those contributions, the pledges rather. Um, uh, that were that were made, and I believe that settlement was in the interest of providing housing for a new minister. And I'll show you how I think that played out with the Hitchcocks. Oh, and, the, and one last note there: you may you may have noticed at the bottom there, voted unanimously that Mr. Hitchcock have an allowance of five Sabbaths out of each year to his own use. Um, the rest of the time, I'd say he was on on duty, um, but he managed to do a lot. On, it, on his free time, I can tell you that, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Meanwhile, Oral was in Amherst, um, and she was um, teaching now, the Academy, had, Deerfield Academy had closed. She was teaching at Amherst Academy, directly across the street from the Jones Library today. Um, and uh, while she was there, she had a young student named Mary Lyon, and they would forge a friendship along with Edward that would last for decades. And of course, Mary had an important career later on that we'll talk about. Well, very curiously, on the 30th or 31st of May, 1821, Edward Hitchcock and Miss Ora White were married. And where were they married? They were married in a tavern in the middle of Amherst, right where that circle shows there. Why this devout couple would be married in a tavern, I don't know, and I've never seen any explanation for it. But there's probably an interesting story that goes along with it. I don't know what it would be. Well, the next day or a few days later, they put all their goods and chattels into a wa horse-drawn wagon, and you can bet that their goods and chattels were few in number, and rattled up that rocky road from Amherst to Deerfield to Conway, and settled in. Where exactly they lived was a little bit of a mystery to me, because this house, everybody knows as a Hitchcock house in Conway. Um, here it is today. It's still... Uh, looks very much as it did 200 or 100 years ago. I think that image is from uh, 1910 or something like that. Um, and so here's a map of what we call Pumpkin Hollow, what you call Pumpkin Hollow today. And there's the Hitchcock House. It belonged to the Williamses before them. John Williams' store. I think there's a sign out there that indicates the store now. And the meeting house in its location at that time. Uh, the mystery in this is that um, 
the deed for that <coughs> transaction, here it is from the Franklin County Registry of Deeds. And again, these are all available online. It's really fascinating to explore them if you have the, the time. And notice it says, know ye that John Williams and Nancy Williams of Conway uh, for and in consideration of the sum of $1,050 to me in hand paid by Edward Hitchcock of Conway, it's a little bit blurry, but maybe that's my eyes, do hereby convey a certain tract of land and the house thereon. So for $1,050, fine, everything's wrapped up. There's only one problem. This happened three years later, the 19th of May in the year of our Lord, 1,824. So where were they living for the three years previous to that? There's no, I've not found any other record. If anybody here knows of any, I'd be interested in knowing. But there's several hints that I've found that suggest that they probably lived in that same house long before they bought it. Maybe right from the beginning when they moved to Conway. Um, in one instance, Edward was refers to his, their house, one years later, their house in Conway, as if there was only one. Uh, in the deed, right in the deed, you can see it says, describes the land, it says including uh, the, Mr. Hitchcock's house and his well. So they're referring in the deed, referring to the land as belonging to Mr. Hitchcock, which kind of suggests that they've been living there already. Can't be sure. But the, the what I've finally discovered that I think clinches it in my mind is that that house was later occupied by at least two uh, successors of Reverend Hitchcock, two later ministers. And each time it was transferred to a third party or parties in between, the new minister moved in, lived there for several years, and then purchased it. So I think this was probably a way that the church could help a new minister to get established without necessity of their putting down a lot of money, which they probably didn't have, to buy a house. So it became kind of an informal parsonage. You often hear John Emerson's house referred to as the parsonage. It was on Baptist Hill. Maybe it's still there. I don't know. But it was his own home. It was not the church's home. Um, and this wasn't the church's home either, but it sounds like the church was involved in several transactions. One last interesting point about it has to do with this fellow with an uh, extraordinary name, Epaphroditus Champion. He was a businessman from um, Connecticut, and he was a real estate tycoon in his day, a flipper, you might call him, who bought and sold real estate. If you go to the Franklin County Registry of Deeds and search on the name Champion, you'll find dozens of transactions that he was involved in in the 18. I don't know, 1800 to 1840 time period. So he was buying and selling land. And here's the other interesting fact, maybe a mystery, but I think you can figure it out, especially if you look at the website. The Hitchcocks bought the house from the Williamses, but their mortgage payments were to Mr. Champion. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so the Williamses had a debt. And you can read more about that on the webpage, and I'll show you at the end. They had a debt that they owed to Mr. Champion. Actually, Mr. Champion, I think, funded that store of John Williams's, and John had some trouble during the recession of 1819. And in his memoir, which is at the Northampton, historic Northampton, his full memoir, he says, I, I ran up a debt of $9,000, which had to be paid. And I suspect that a $9,000 debt in those days was a lot of money. Um, well, in the first summer that the Hitchcocks were, were in Conway, they undertook a very interesting project together. Uh, these newlyweds without you know, the obligations of uh, family and yet. Um, and that was to uh, go foraging around the town uh, for mushrooms and fungi. Um, to create this little album, this lovely little album, it's about six inches by eight inches, called Fungi Selecti Pipti. And so they brought oh, these nice. mushrooms and fungi back to the house, and before they could turn to mush, as uh, Edward said in one of his letters, um, or a painted one. And so keep in mind, these paintings are tiny, maybe a half dollar size or a little bit larger, but they're in exquisite detail. And the thing that amazes me is how well preserved the colors are. 
And this album is in the uh, special collections at Smith College. And if you're interested, you can go there and they'll make you wear gloves and they'll you know, take great pains with you. But you can look at it page after page after page of these tiny, lovely little uh, illustrations. Just one of the many projects that they did together um, during the course of their marriage. Um, <clears throat> on June 24th, 1821, Reverend Hitchcock delivered his first sermon. Now, Edward Hitchcock was, um, um, just scout ahead here. Make no mistake about it, Edward Hitchcock's basic message was the central message of Orthodox Christianity the personal relationship with God, uh, repentance for one's sin and renewal of one's heart. Um, but this sermon was entitled A Glance at the Future. And it might sound like it was going to be a fluffy kind of a sermon about where we're going with the church and with the community and our hopes for the future and so on. Uh, it wasn't fluffy at all. It had to do with the judgment day because that was the future that Edward Hitchcock was very concerned that for himself, his family, and for his parishioners. And I want to read you that, hey, that section that's highlighted there on the last paragraph of his sermon. After 45 minutes, he said to his congregation, we shall not attempt to paint before you the terrors and solemnities of that day, the burning universe, the opening graves, the shout of the archangel, the son of man coming in the clouds with power and great glory the tribunal of God rising on the ruins of the world, God himself ascending the judgment seat, the book of life opening, wherein is registered the character and the fate of every individual, the joy on the one side or the agony on the other side, as this judge separates the righteous from the wicked. And then he said to his congregation, this day, the judgment day, is at hand, when you will sleep no more unless you can sleep in a lake of fire and brimstone, unless you can sleep amid the gnawings of the undying worm, unless you can sleep in the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Wow. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the nature of his sermons, one of the most important messages of his sermons, and it was not unusual for his time. I think that people thought that you had to be have the fear of God in you, that literally, uh, to make you uh, 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 a moral person, to force you to live a moral life. A few months later, he gave a, a children's Sunday sermon, and you'd think that would be all light and fluffy, but he said the same thing to the children. He said, you know, most of, half of you are going to die before the age of 12. <laughs> so he was not uh, into, uh, you know, he was not into light content in his sermons. Um, the following January, he uh, preached a sermon about the new year. It sounds like it comes right out of today, doesn't it? Such an important season as this, the new year, ought not then to pass by without pausing and looking into our hearts and back upon our lives and forward upon the days to come. Yet with the greater part of us, the farm, the money, the merchandise, or the honors and pleasures of the world so absorb our thoughts that our resolutions prove mere empty words, and scarcely do we think of them again until we find that this year is gone. <laughs> Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? And 200 years later, we're still doing the same thing. Go to those fitness clubs the first week of January and see how many people are there, and then go a month later and see how many people are there. So anyway, he was uh, warning his parishioners, and that was another central theme of Hitchcock's sermons. Don't get too wrapped up in the pleasures, the honors, the uh, rewards of this world. Keep your eye on the prize, on that future world. One of his particular concerns, now this was an important message in Conway, because Conway was such a prosperous community at the time. Big farms, prosperous farms, many industries, prosperous industries. Here's one of the biggest and most prosperous of the farms. And he constantly warned his parishioners again and again in sermons not to become too taken with all of this uh, prosperity. In fact, he thought, he did a whole sermon once about prosperity is the ruin of mankind. <laughs> and he preached it at Amherst once when they were really doing well and said, we got to be careful, folks, because this is when we're going to start to go downhill is when, when the finances are really strong. So, um, And one of his, his uh, harps here was on equipage. 
he talked about beware of the appeal of equipage. Now that's an old-fashioned word referring to horse-drawn carriages, sleighs, wagons, and so on. He thought these were kind of the symbols of prosperity that um, farmers and wealthy people uh, used to show off their wealth and that they should be fearful of those or careful about those. Now this warning about beware the, the awards and pleasures and so on of this world, he admitted later in his life that he fell into that, particularly late in his life, and became very much consumed with his own accomplishments. But he was young and idealistic at this time. And of course, you recognize that uh, uh, farm. It uh, was lovely and handsome and well cared for then, and it's just as lovely and handsome and well cared for today. Uh, um, and while Edward Hitchcock's sermons largely concerned the fundamentals of, of um, uh, Orthodox Christianity, he from time to time took opportunity to preach about the social issues of his day. He was unstinting in his uh, um, criticism of America for the treatment, mistreatment of the Native Americans. He was very outspoken, you might imagine, about temperance. And he was very outspoken about war, particularly when he was president of Amherst College. That was the time of the Mexican-American War. And he even suggested, and this must have been very controversial at the time, that American soldiers would be within their rights to refuse to serve in an immoral war. Um, and of course, he preached against slavery. And this sermon, at the tops of every one of his sermons, these are all in the, almost all of these are in the Amherst College, uh, thank you, um, archives and special collections, but there are quite a few in the Pocumtuck Valley Historic Deerfield collections as well. But this, you notice that he's got places where and dates when he delivered these. So this one was delivered at Greenfield in 1820, at Shelburne in 1821 and in Conway in 1822. And he says, the existence of slavery in a land of tyranny is to be expected. In a land of monarchy, monarchy, it might be endured. But in a free country, it is intolerable. It is an abomination of desolations standing where it ought not. As individuals, we are not chargeable with this sin, but as members of this nation, can we say that we are free from the blood of these innocent men? He gave this sermon a number of times, both in churches and in chapel at, um, um, at Amherst College later in his life. Of course, you might say, well, of course a preacher would have been against slavery. A lot of New England preachers were uh, silent on the matter, and there were even some who were apologists for slavery, but not Edward Hitchcock. Um, well, finally, Edward Hitchcock was not inclined to introduce personal matters into his sermons. But so his congregation must have been shocked on the day in March of 1824 when he had this to say. Thus far I had preceded my hearers in the composition of this discourse when I was called away to witness in the prostrated agonies and final removal of an only child, a painful exhibition of the sovereign dominion of Jehovah. And that child was their first child. Ed, little Edward, um, who was less than two years old when he died. Um, there's his grave right over here in the Howard Cemetery to this day. Um, and then he went on to say something which I think is some of the most striking lines in all of his sermons. He said, if there is one feeling within us, meaning him and Aura, um, stronger than the rest, it is a sense that we deserve that punishment. And it lends smarting poignancy to the wound to know that the arrow which has pierced us passed first through the heart of our child. I mean, can you imagine a harsher verdict on a couple who are suffering from the loss of a child to think that they were responsible for it? Um, but that was the nature of Edward and Ora's uh, faith. Um, so um, Edward, um, About a year and a half later, in October of 1825, Edward resigned his pastorate in Conway. Why did he resign? Well, he told his congregation it was because of poor health. 
But he even admitted in his own writings that that wasn't entirely the whole story. And I think there's probably three other reasons. One was the death of little Edward, which no doubt made it painful for them to stay in uh, Conway. Another was his split loyalties. During his four years in Conway, as minister of that church, he published 20 scientific papers. So you get a definite feeling that he had, uh, his scientific interests were at least as strong as his interest in the ministry. And of course, the third factor was that he'd been offered a post at Amherst College. But before he left, he had these words to say. He felt very deep guilt and remorse the rest of his life about this. And he wrote in his final sermon, he said in his final sermon here in October of that year, the account of my ministry in this place is now sealed up to the judgment of the great day. There I shall soon meet you all, and that account will be opened to the everlasting joy of some to the everlasting grief of others. He was still, you know, had his eye on that judgment day. It was a reality for him. Uh, it was nothing abstract. And he, uh, in a sermon he delivered in Conway 20 years later. Now, the Hitchcocks were much beloved in Conway, as you know. And one of the evidences of that is that Edward was invited back to preach 20 times in the next 20 years after he left here. So he was very much admired. The town was rightfully proud of him and his accomplishments, and Orr's as well. And he came back in 1845 for the um, installation of a new minister and he gave a sermon and he said amid the many delightful recollections which the retrospect of my short ministry affords I confess that a sense of unfaithfulness and deficiency in duty outweighs all other considerations and prevents my ever looking forward to the final reckoning but with solemn trembling for how overwhelming the thought that I may meet some soul there in at the judgment day who will charge his eternal ruin to my unfaithfulness. <laughs> well, Edward went, began it, um, his, took his post at, at that month in 1825 at Amherst College. Amherst was only four years old at the time, and remember, it was chartered for the purpose of training young men for the Christian ministry. So Edward must have felt this would be a perfect place for me to continue my pastoral work, my preaching, but also pursue my scientific interests. He taught chemistry, mineralogy, geology, natural history, botany, and Bible studies. But geology was his first love. And if you notice, he taught it for 37 years, every single year for 37 years, including the nine years of his presidency. The family moved into this house on South Pleasant Street that's still there to this day. It's on the, it's part of the Amherst College campus, and that's where uh, they raised Mary and Catherine and Edward Jr. and Jane, Charles, and Emily. I'll say a little bit about them at the end. Um, in 1829, he started recording his private notes, kind of like a diary, but much less regular than every day, you know, every few weeks or every few months. And in 1833, he wrote, if his providence does not save me, I shall soon be in my grave. In the next year, he wrote, perhaps my present state of health is only a short respite from the grave. In 1847, while he was president, he wrote, the college will rise and flourish, but I must die soon. And in 1859, he wrote, the probability is faint of my seeing another year, and I long to be prepared to go. You might say that he was consumed, even obsessed, with his own death. And you might think that such a uh, fixation on one's impending doom would have a depressing effect. But it was exactly the opposite of that Edward Hitchcock, because his feeling that his life was soon coming to an end became an incentive, a constant incentive for him to get back to work, to complete the projects that he had to do, to do the work that God had set out for him. And sometimes even to take on big new projects. And that he did in 1830 in a very big way. Um, because his health wasn't that good, and he had a growing family, and he had a full-time job at Amherst College. But he wrote a letter to Governor Levi uh, Lincoln in Boston, proposing a geological survey of Massachusetts. And within a month, he had the job. And in July of that summer, he started traveling around the state in a horse-drawn wagon, usually with a student assistant. 
collecting rocks and minerals, recording pages and pages of notes, uh, and preparing a report on the geology of Massachusetts. Notice that in just the first year, he traveled some 1,600 miles. And those are hard miles on a horse drawn wagon, you can be sure. And visited 158 towns, and that was just in the first year. Um, it makes me dizzy just thinking about it. He continued for the next three years and visited um, some 260 cities and towns, not only in Massachusetts, but towns in adjacent states as well. Um, the main goal, uh, one goal of his survey was to draw an accurate geological map of the state, and he did that in his first report in 1833. There it is there. It holds up very well compared to maps today, considering that the technology available to him was limited to what you see there, a geologist's hammer. Um, and his main purpose of the survey, certainly in the eyes of the legislature and the governor, were economic. They wanted him to find new economic resources that would be valuable to the state. And I have to say on balance that I don't think his, his uh, survey was in that dimension was all that successful. For one thing, the granite in the east and the limestone in the west were already being widely, you know, extensively uh, extracted. So he can't take any credit for that. Um, and he had some predictions for the future that didn't exactly pan out. He said that the anthracite of Rhode Island, even that of Worcester, will be considered by uh, posterity, if not by the present generation, as a treasure of great value. Well, there is coal in central southeastern Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. There is coal, but you can bet that nobody ever made a penny <laughs> mining it or selling it because it was inferior quality, which, of course, Hitchcock probably didn't know, or he'd have no idea about what other coal resources would soon become available elsewhere in the country. And similarly, and almost humorously, he visited a mine in Somerset, Vermont, where he found some grains of, of gold. And he said, how far south the gold may be found remains to be shown. May we not expect to find it near the Holly Mine of Iron, since this is in Talco shale? shale? Well, I don't think there was ever a gold rush in Holly, Massachusetts. <laughs> 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 if I'm wrong, but I don't think so. So uh, from the economic point of view, I'm not sure that his predictions, many of them panned out that well. But there were several very, very important consequences of his survey. One has to do with the evidence of Noah's flood, because Hitchcock, like most scientists and people of faith of his day, believed in that story from the Bible, from the book of Genesis, about the great flood, the flood of Noah and his ark. And as Hitchcock traveled around the state, he saw lots of evidence for some, some great calamity. Um, there were these grooves in bedrock, he called them diluvial grooves, all oriented in the same direction, north and west. And there were these large boulders long f f far to, uh, south and east of their source. Um, and um, he uh, started to question whether or not these could have been the result of a great flood. The boulders particularly intrigued him. And that one there, um, he called it the Green Mountain uh, Boulder. Uh, the Green Mountain Giant, he believed it was the largest one in Vermont. It's in Whitingham, Vermont. And it is pretty big. I can attest to that, because there I am standing in front of it just a couple of years ago. Um, and um, in other places, he found trains of boulders, like this famous train here across Richmond, Stockbridge, and Cheeringham in Berkshire County, consisting of hundreds, perhaps thousands of boulders, all carried from a mountaintop in New York State down in a roughly a straight line to the south and to the east. And he wrote in his final report in 1833, making every allowance for the reduction of the gravity of these boulders when in water. I confess, I cannot conceive how such a work could have been effected by this agency. In other words, he couldn't imagine any flood great enough to, to have these effects. And of course, it was only about four years later, or five years later, that this man, Louis Agassiz, published his landmark work on um, continental glaciation. And Edward Hitchcock was probably the first American geologist to embrace uh, Agassiz's theory. Well, of course, Edward is best known for those uh, dinosaur footprints that we all know about. He called them fossil footmarks of the Connecticut Valley. 
He was first introduced to them by this man, very famous man in, of Greenfield, Dr. James Dean, in 1835. Dean thought that they might be the tracks of great birds, and Hitchcock, when he saw them, agreed. Uh, first of all, they were three-toed. Secondly, the creatures walked on their toes. They were digitigrade. And thirdly, the creatures were bipedal. They walked on two feet. And so he concluded, uh, Hitchcock concluded, that they were most likely the tracks of ancient birds. Like everything that he did, he threw himself into this with every ounce of energy that he had. He immediately traveled up and down the Connecticut Valley, all the way down to Middletown and further south than that, found dozens of other locations, collected hundreds and eventually thousands of tracks, and began publishing papers on his findings. And his uh, message was that these, oh, and he, his collections grew so large that in 1855 they had to build a special building at Amherst College. There it is there, the Appleton Cabinet, to house them. It's now a dormitory, uh, but there's a brand new home for his collections. Right. It's the Vanesky Museum of Natural History. I bet many of you have been there. If you have not, it's been closed for a while, but it's reopened now. It's awesome. It really is. And it displays Edward's tracks collection so, so magnificently. I had visited the Pratt Museum of Natural History, as I say in my book, when I was about 10 years old with my father. And the tracks were all hidden away in a basement, sort of like you see there, although it wasn't the Appleton cabinet. And they were, it was very obscure, and hard to see them. They weren't labeled or anything like that. And even as a 10-year-old, I said, gee, this doesn't seem right. Well, here we are 50 years later, 60 years later, and uh, they finally are getting their, their due. Why isn't it called the Hitchcock Museum of Natural History? Because Hitchcock didn't give $5 million to Amherst College for the construction of it. So, so I don't think he would begrudge Mr. Bernesky in the least. Um, of course, Hitchcock uh, developed this avian hypothesis that these were the tracks of ancient birds. And it ruffled a few feathers <laughs> in two respects. One, because it set back, if that was true, it set back the age of birds, when birds appear on Earth, by several hundred million years in the minds of most paleontologists of this time. So that was rather controversial. And of course, the other was the size. This is one of Orr's uh, drawings from one of his, his papers. Many of these were you know, 16, 18 inches long. So he got a lot of pushback from the public. Scientists, both in North America and in Europe, within five years were on board. They all agreed that they were the tracks of animals, and most agreed that they were the tracks of either birds or bird-like organisms of some kind. It was the public press that harangued Edward, and to a certain extent, Dr. Dean as well. And Edward didn't handle that really well. But they said over and over again, how could, why did Edward Hitchcock insist on calling those bird tracks or tracks of birds? Why didn't he realize they were the tracks of dinosaurs? Well, he didn't insist, he did not insist that they were the tracks of birds. He favored that simply because they fit the description of the modern bird very, very closely. Uh, you know the saying, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, <laughs> it's probably a duck. Well, the same thing could be said for those tracks. They just had the look of bird tracks. Um, but again and again in his, in his uh, later life, he admitted this. In the 1843 speech, he said that there may have been animals in the red sandstone period of a different class, say reptiles, with feet so exactly like our present birds as some of the tracks on stone seem to be. It is easy to imagine. So again and again in his life, he conceded that this was just a hypothesis and that he might prove wrong. Why didn't he call them dinosaur tracks? Well, the simple reason is the word dinosaur hadn't even been coined when Edward Hitchcock started his research. And when it was coined by this man, Sir Richard Owen, in 1841, it was used to describe some animals that couldn't possibly have been the track makers. You see why? First of all, they're four-legged. They're walking around on four feet. Secondly, they're not digitigrade. They're plantigrade, like us, right? They walk on the soles of their feet. And the number of toes is all, right, is, is all wrong. So there's no way that we would have expected Edward Hitchcock to call his track makers dinosaurs then. Eventually, the, the um, concept of the dinosaur, the definition of the dinosaur, was expanded. But that was very close to the end of Edward Hitchcock's uh, life. Well, in the 20th century, our view of dinosaurs changed. And suddenly, it seemed like Edward Hitchcock was uh, in again. Um, and not that he was ever out in the, in the views of most scientists, 
but he did receive a lot more credit in the 20th century. Martin Watley of the University of Colorado wrote, Hitchcock was right all along. The tracks were indeed those of special types of birds. And this man, Robert Baker, probably the foremost American dinosaur expert, has written, Hitchcock was the earliest and in many ways the best mind in dinosaur science. All of us 21st century students of the dinosaur bird relations owe a tip of the hat toward the Reverend Edward Hitchcock. So Hitchcock was the first, I think it's safe to say, the first American scientist to recognize evidence of dinosaurs in North America, even though he didn't know them and nobody knew them as dinosaurs at the time. Well, in 1844, the fortunes of Amherst College had reached a low point. They were running out of money fast. Uh, they were um, running out of the room that, room that was uh, plunging, and there was a Sort of bad atmosphere on the campus as well. And the trustees turned to Edward Hitchcock because they felt he was the only man that could save the institution. The trustees believed in him, the uh, faculty believed in him, the students believed in him, the general public believed in him. Everybody believed in Edward Hitchcock. Everybody, that is, except Edward Hitchcock. Uh, and in his inauguration, now picture this, you know, the meeting house in Amherst. Uh, you know, with all of these hundreds of people gathered on this important day, he said, but here it is right to confess that my judgment coincides with my feelings and the conclusions that I am unadapted to meet the present exigency. Can imagine how well that must have gone over. But then he said, but I yield to the judgment of the trustees and friends of the college and cheerfully attempt the experiment in reliance upon able coadjutors and above all upon help from on high. Well, he probably did get help from on high, but he got a lot of help from a more earthbound source, from this man, Samuel Wilson, who the night before his inauguration made the biggest donation ever to Amherst College, simply because Williston believed in Edward Hitchcock. And that was followed by several other large gifts, so that the uh, debt of the college was erased within three years. And Edward wrote some years later, oh, what a load did these benefactions take from my mind. Well, Edward and Orr moved into the, um, I was about to say the White House, into the President's House at Hanover's College in 1845, much against their wishes. Um, the place became a social hub for the campus. Orr was a marvel. Edward, you might guess, was not a party animal, but Orr could organize these things. And she, they, they marshaled their children, most of whom were teens or adults by now. And it was really a family affair putting on these events. And they really changed the atmosphere of the college and in that and in other ways. Ora, I wrote in my book, Ora was his anchor, his rudder, his keel. Without her steadying hand, her constancy, her faithfulness, his career would, would have had a different trajectory. His life would likely have been shortened by decades. His soul buried in self-doubt and guilt. That ship would most certainly have foundered on the rocks. So Orr was not only a fine artist who helped him with so many of his publications, but she was also, it was her temperament, I think, and her, of course her religious sentiments, but also that temperament. She was able to float through life when Edward was being tossed up and down uh, by the way things uh, went. Um, and um, so at the end of his presidency, Edward could point to a doubling of enrollment, the elimination of the debt of the college, four new professorships, three new buildings, and most importantly of all, harmony restored within the college. The value of Dr. Hitchcock's presidency, wrote William Tyler in 1873, uh, cannot be overestimated. His weight of character and his wise policy saved the college. Um, so Edward's role in saving Amherst College is well known. Not as well known as his important role at Mount Holyoke, where he and Ora supported Mary Lyon uh, up until and following the establishment of Mount Holyoke Female Seminary in 1837. And Edward was a founding member of the Board of Trustees there, and he remained a member for the rest of his life. And all four of the Hitchcock daughters attended Mount Holyoke, I think for two years, most of them for two years. Um, so Edward was, was uh, very important, Edward Andor, very important in the establishment and success of Mount Holyoke. 
Edward was also instrumental in the establishment of another institution, local institution. He uh, lobbied for the establishment of an agricultural college in Massachusetts for the last 15 years or so of his life, no, for, uh, 12 or 13 years of his life. Now, he didn't argue that it should be an Amherst. I think maybe he felt that would, would have been proper. But he argued that there should be such an institution. And a few years after he died, when the state legislature finally approved that charter, um, the people of Amherst ponied up, I think it was $10,000, to ensure that it would be located in Amherst. So I can't say that Edward was responsible for getting it to Amherst, but I think Edward deserves a lot of the credit for there being a UMass today. Well, the, for Edward's, Edward's most important, uh, I think if you ask him, Edward would say his most um, important mission in life um, was to um, uh, overcome the barrier between science and religion. Um, fast forward here. His greatest ambition in life was to convince his fellow scientists, clergymen, and the general public that science and faith need not be antagonistic, that science should not be regarded as the enemy of religion. He wrote several dozens of papers, scholarly papers on the subject, but in 1851 he published this, what he regarded as his most important work, a book entitled The Religion of Geology and its Interconnected Sciences. And in that work he said, the hostility between science and revelation is only apparent, not real. When rightly interpreted and understood, they will appear in perfect unison. Well, the clash between science and religion came to a head about that time, just a year or two after, no, just about five years after the publication of Hitchcock's book, with the publication of this work, of course, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Um, many scientists and men of faith, and they were almost all that I know at that time, men, came out strongly against Darwinism, saying that it was a affront to religion. Um, and, um, Hitchcock was among them. He argued strenuously against Darwinism on a number of religious points. But if you read Hitchcock's papers carefully in the last few years of his life, you see his thinking about Darwin beginning to change, beginning to pivot. In a paper published just a year before his death, he wrote, but after all, the real question is not whether these hypotheses accord or with our religious views, but whether they are true. And then he went on to say, the fact that these new creations, new species, are repeated at intervals and seem to form a part of a series of operations, which we know to be natural, makes it quite probable they also are natural. Perhaps this unknown law will by and by be discovered, natural selection, for example, as many new laws have been, to explain phenomena once supposed to be miraculous, because anomalous and inexplicable. In other words, Edward was holding open, keeping the door open, keeping his mind open to the possibility of natural selection, of evolution, even of human evolution. Um, and uh, so there's a story told by one of Edward's students many years after he died uh, about uh, how uh, Professor Hitchcock was standing in a room the first day of a new semester in a room that was previously all dark, but a, a new uh, skylight had been installed. And light was streaming into the, lo to the room. And Professor Hitchcock smiled at his students as he looked up at the light. And he said this phrase, which I think is a perfect summary of his fundamental principle. Young gentlemen, all the light we have here comes from that, as you could guess, is how I came up with the title for my book. Um, so I'm, I'll leave it there, except to point out that I do have a web page, www.edwardhitchcock.com, that has a whole lot more information about Hitchcock, um, if you're interested in doing more reading, and of course about my book. Um, I especially want to draw your attention to my blog, Hitchcockiana, which I add to periodically. And you might get a kick out of the section about Hitchcock's giant boulders. It includes directions to those two boulders that I visited a year and a half ago. You might get a kick out of this story. I had the opportunity to meet Emily and Sawyer Hitchcock a year and a half ago at Smith College. And they are the great, 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 great grandchildren. Quite, a, quite, quite an amazing uh, 
opportunity for me. There's more about the Hitchcock house and how the, the investigation that uh, I had to do to figure out, and I'm still open to more ideas about, about that. Uh, there's more about the, uh, the um, fungi select die pick die. Um, and in the quick links, you'll, on that page, you'll notice a link to the Conway Town Records. So if you're interested in town history and uh, have the time, I think you might get a kick out of reading some of those. Um, the last thing is that there's a page about the descendants of Edward Hitchcock that includes some things about his children, Edward Jr., Charles, and Emily, um, professor at Amherst College, professor at Dartmouth College, botanical illustrator, and she worked at Smith College for many years. Jane Elizabeth, a granddaughter, became a very eminent community nurse, published many papers on it when it was a new field at the turn of the century. Dr. John Sawyer Hitchcock was the personal physician of Calvin Coolidge, lived in Northampton, but he was also the Anthony Fauci of his day because a hundred years ago, he was responsible, he was the responsible for infectious diseases in Massachusetts in 1918, 1919. So he was faced with an epidemic that even makes a COVID epidemic seem small by, by comparison. And I don't know, somebody here might have known Margaret Hitchcock Emerson. She was a great granddaughter of, the, of Edward M. Laura, and she lived in Northampton, and she was one of the first archivists at Amherst College to work with her great grandparents' um, papers. Um, there's also a series of Zoom casts, short Zoom casts, 15 minute Zoom casts on different Hitchcock topics. <clears throat> and of course, I urge you, if you're at all interested, to read my book. It's available in paperback and in several ebook formats. You can buy it at your local independent bookstore or from any of the usual online sources. I have a few copies here tonight if you're interested for $15 a piece. Uh, but I can also tell you that it's in many, many libraries already, so it's easily available. Um, I hope you'll give it a try. Uh, I think you'll find that it gives you a lot of insight into life, not only to Edward and Oral, but to their times. The life, life in America at that time, life in Conway, life in Amherst, life in Deerfield at that time. And the last thing I want to say is I want to thank so many different organizations that helped me in my research, particularly the Amherst College Archives and Special Collections, the Conway Historical Commission and Historical Society, the Historic Deerfield, and the Pocomtuck Valley Memorial Association. So <clears throat> I'll leave it there, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have them.